speak on business priorities in current economic environment. Very good morning, all of you. Uh, by professing, I'm an economist. Uh, and of course, I've been teaching economics for a long time in India, and also I taught abroad uh, at various levels. So it's quite natural that when I speak about business priorities in current economic environment, it's a little pedantic, not very hands-on kind of you know experience that you're looking forward to me, but I believe it's important because you need to understand the macro environment in order to carry on any micro-level business. Because these days, uh, we are living in a world of globalization and we cannot actually isolate uh, X from the wider perspective of Y. So we are all a part of a fraction of uh, the global perspective. You do business at a small scale, you do business at a medium scale or do at a large scale, it doesn't matter, but you need to have global perspective. That's the first thing I would like to, like to start with. Quite often we think that, okay, we, our business is local and uh, we are situated in Jaipur, so why am I worried about the rest of the world? But well, that's not it. Uh, why, it is not, uh, why it is not so? Because you, know, you are just a fraction or a part of the entire whole and the entire whole is changing. Once the globe is changing, then you know, be, you, it doesn't matter where you are, you are in Jaipur or you are in a small town or even in a village, it doesn't matter. Everything percolates down and you are a part of it and you need to actually understand what is happening around the globe for two reasons. One, one reason is very critical because it's for survival. You can't just survive because if you don't understand what is happening around the globe and you you have the opportunity to learn from that, adapt your, your business, bring adaptations in your business, adopt new ways uh, in order to survive. So it's a, it's a critical point that you, know, you may not survive if you don't understand what is happening around the globe. That's one critical point that you, you are a part of the entire universe. Another point is very crucial is that you, know, you cannot make profit or you cannot grow if you don't understand what is happening around the globe. I mean, these two points are at the bottom of it, and I'm going to focus on these two points merely. What is going to make, uh, what is the kind of change which is happening around the globe? That's one part we need to understand, so that's the one part of my deliberations today. Another part of deliberation is that what kind of message are we going to take as a, as a business people, uh, be it a small business or medium business, so that we can actually survive as a critical point and second, how can take mileage out of it, how we can grow by assimilating ourselves into the change. So these two aspects I'm going to, so I'm, I've divided my talk into two parts, one talking about the business environment, what is happening across the globe, what are the main features of it, and second, I'll be talking about what are the business priorities. Now in business priorities, there can be you know a list of 20 priorities what can talk about, or even more. Uh, but I'm going to focus on days to come. So I'm not going to look at historical perspective and say, okay, in general, business priorities are 20 in numbers. But I'm going to look at what is going to happen in 2013. In fact, what is going to happen in 2013 to 15, let's say. I mean, I'm, I'm taking a very short perspective in mind because that's very important today because if you don't look at from the short perspective point of view, your long perspective get blurred. Because long perspectives are accumulation of the short perspective and the short perspectives are changing so fast that you cannot actually build your long perspective without looking at what is happening today, what is going to happen in the next two years. So things are changing so fast. And that's the reason why I chose to focus, and that's, that's of course at a, at a kind of small risk I'm taking, to focus on a short term perspective. But it has got long, long term implications as well. So I'm going to focus on this. Now, one more thing which I have decided to talk about today is that uh, in order not to be very big pedantic in my speeches and, and focusing more on the academic side rather than getting more practical. So I'm going to pick up one particular theme out of you know, 2030 which we can talk about as business priorities. And then I'm going to focus a little more on this one particular aspect and talk about a few things about it. It's going to be better than talking about 20 things uh, which you'll go here and there. 
So I, today I, I, have cho I, I chose myself to be very, very specific in nature. So how I'm going to start is that I'm going to talk about growth story. Uh, that's the first, first part I'm going to talk about. I'll devote some five, seven minutes to it. Now when I'm talking about growth story, I'm going to link it with the recent events and let's have a contradictory views that has emerged of late. Uh, the first thing that has happened in India today is that uh, Raghuram Rajan has take over, taken over RBI. That's one thing that has happened, and it, this has happened precisely because of a reason, you know, behind it. Why this has happened? The rupee is falling continuously, and people are so worried about it. Where is the bottom line? Is this going to revive or not? Now, the scenario, if you look at uh, after 2007, that started in years, and and in the spreading start still Europe in 2008. And uh, we also felt the burn of the financial crisis uh, at home. And we thought perhaps the things are going to be changed a little bit, and India is in a better position to, to, to cope with this kind, of, uh, this kind of situation because we have a little conservative mechanism in place. Now, I'm not going into the detail of what happened to rupees, why it is sliding down, what is the possibility of coming back. As a business person, you all know this story very well. What I'm talking about is the recent news that has actually uh, you know, clouded a little bit of fame of uh, Professor Amartya Sen. You know. uh, I'm, I'm sure all of you must be knowing this name. Uh, Professor Amartya Sen uh, is a Nobel laureate in economics. And he is an Indian, now more or less settled in US, and he's a Harvard professor. So he got Nobel Prize. Now there is another person, uh, Professor Jagdish Bhagwati. I mean, I'm just introducing two names in order to bring the things in perspective because there has to be some background in which I'm going to talk about it. Professor Bhagwati, he is also an Indian, he is settled in Columbia University and uh, you know he is no less than, less accomplished uh, a scholar than Professor Singh. Uh, India has produced so many great people in economics and, and if you look at actually the quality of work, many of them are contender of Nobel Prize. Jigis Bhagwati is one of them, so probably in times to come he might get Nobel Prize. So that's what we are thinking about. Now what happened of late is that Professor Singh has come into controversy for two reasons. And we need to understand what are these two reasons and why these reasons have cropped up. And that gives us the perspective to talk about Indian economy. So one reason was that he actually made some comment on the opposition party, you know, stalwart in Gujarat. And then he came into controversy. So that was one reason for which he was in the news. Another reason was very important, and that was the attack which was made systematically on him by Professor Bhagwati, and that's very important. We need to understand why Professor Bhagwati has made this attack, and what is the difference between these two, two views, and how it affects us. That's the perspective I'm going to take. A political perspective I'm not going to take because uh, that's not the domain I'm going to speak much on that, but that requires a little more time to talk about, and I have got limited time of 20-25 minutes to finish it. So I'm going to take the economic perspective. Professor Singh, and along with his one of our colleagues, uh, Dr. Drez, he they brought out a book of late. And uh, this book is, uh, the title of this book is uh, The Uncertain Glory. You may like to have a copy of it and read. It's a wonderful reading because Professor Singh, I'm, I'm one of the, one of the, you know, admirer of his writings. Uh, when you read Professor Sen, it reminds you of the father of economics, uh, Professor uh, you know, uh, Adam Smith, when he used to write. Uh, one great thing about Smith was that uh, he wasn't considered so much big in economics by many intellectuals as in the field of literature. Because people, when you read their books, it doesn't sound like economics. It sounds more like a literary piece and a kind of story which is going on. And same is true with Professor Sen. He's, he has a lucidity of writing. And when you read his dissertations, you read Idea of Justice, you read his dissertation on Femi, any dissertation you pick up, and then you find this kind of you know, literary touch in his writing. He's a wonderful speaker, he's a wonderful writer. It's a kind of story. So I recommend that all of you should pick up and read because that gives you a wonderful perspective on India, uncertain glory. What he argued is that uh, look around the world and then see. Uh, you know, the growth has not done good to us. That's what he says. Let's say, for example, today also uh, in newspaper, and there was a lot of articles that came in many prominent journals which cited some of the examples where, you know, a small family coming from the village is talking about his own 
own imperatives and his own constraints in sending the son to the school. He says, you know, I can't afford my son to go to the school because I don't have enough to support. And then they are talking about a situation where, where child, children's survival is, is not happening. Say, for example, you know, one third of uh, uh, child mortality uh, you know, uh, is prevalent in India. So one out of three is likely to die in India if we're talking about the small children. If you're talking about undernourishment, the entire world, you look at one third of the undernourished population lives in India. You know, what has growth done to us? So if you look at the growth story of India that you know, he is focusing on, basically, he's saying we have been trying for sustainable, high and inclusive growth. Inclusive growth is the time when we are talking about now. So growth has different phases in India, uh, right from 1947, mid-60s, we had high sustained growth from mid-60s to Late 80s, we had a slow growth, and some of them, uh, you know, talked about a kind of three and a half percent growth over a long period of time, and said Indian economy is stagnating. And then we talked about the growth convergence. We say, okay, I mean, the kind of growth which we had after 1980 has has brought us a lot to, nearer to the rest of the world, because the the the, the earlier idea of uh, uh, the earlier achievements in growth actually. Uh, made us a divergent from the rest of the world, and we were actually moving in a diagonally, you know, opposite uh, manner. But post 80, it has brought us a lot of convergence. And one more thing that people started talking about is that we have been decoupled with the major economies of the world. For example, when U.S. economy will slow down, the rest of the world will also slow down because U.S. economy is a dominant economy and it has impact on on the rest of the world. And then people started talking about, no, here is the time when perhaps we have decoupled because there are periods where the US economy and the major big economies in the world has slowed down, but we have not slowed down, especially the China and India growth story. And there was a time when we were growing at 8% and we were thinking about double digit growth rate and China was growing in double digit. So these are some of the stories, success stories we have written, we have rewritten about growth. But what happened over time is that we have slowed down considerably. So question that Sain is asking in uncertain, uncertain glory is that, has growth done good to us? And, and then the, the, the next question he is saying that if economic growth takes place, does it necessarily mean that all the problems are getting over? Uh, and then he says, absolutely the answer is no, because we look at economies of the world around and then, and then he compares with South African situation, Latin American situation, and he also makes a comparison with Bangladesh, and he says even a country poor, as poor as Bangladesh is able to actually solve all these kind of problems like undernourishment, children going to the school, basic health issues, uh, basic education for our people. They have been able to address them better, <coughs> though the growth rate in Bangladesh has been quite low. So this means. Uh, if you're talking about you know glorifying a growth period of 50, 60 years in India, it has not done so much to us precisely because our focus on human development and the social development has been a little lower. So what he suggests is that once you focus on human development like health, education, and things like that, and then your human capital grows and quality of people becomes better, it adds to the growth. That's what uh, he says. And he says, yes, I mean, there is a role for the government to come forward, you know, invest money in these areas. There is a role for private sector corporates who can also focus attention on these areas. So that's what he's talking about. Bhagavati is, 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 is different in his opinion. He says, oh, this is something which is euphoric to talk about. And what has growth done so far to us? And he has published uh, uh, a recent article in which he <coughs> made a very scathing remark on Saints uh, and uh, the article is uh, Why Growth Matters and he wrote it with his colleague uh, Pani Kariya and Pani Kariya is also one of the front leading economists uh, India has produced. Now these two, two people are of the opinion that well growth matters. He says it's not that if you make people qualitatively better and then they contribute to the growth. He says it is growth which makes people qualitatively better, you know, it's other way around. So he was saying that, okay, saying was okay, but you know, he was walking on his head, he should walk on his feet. And walking on feet means 
you know, you have to have a strong growth, and that increases the per capita income of people. And the moment per capita income of people increases, leave it to people how they are going to spend this money. And, and, and essentially, the moment your income increases, you are going to spend on quality of life. But that's, that's his presumption. So once your income increases, you spend it on quality of life. You know, I'm one of the votaries of uh, Professor Bhagwati, though I am a very ardent supporter of Professor Sen. So I'm, I'm caught in between way to go, this side or that side. But I think both are right in their own way. I'm not going to take a middle path, but I'll say, okay, growth is important. So I would like to open my card and say, okay, Bhagwati, to a larger extent, is correct. Because you know, what happens with human nature is that, you know, the moment you try to tell them how to manage your social needs, and here is the policy, here is the money, and the government is the best person, knows how to manage your social need. It doesn't actually work that way. So you have the midday meal, it doesn't work. You have all kinds of social policies for you know, the betterment of health, it doesn't work. All you can do is that put an infrastructure in place, let people decide how they're going to use it. And when you make people free to decide, and the moment they have the income in their hand, they are going to spend on education, they are going to spend on health, and you know it's going to be all right. So there are instances all over the globe which says that growth, strong growth is very important. So the bottom line is strong growth. Now the moment bottom line is strong growth, there is a role for business in it. And that's why I said, you know, for a country like India, <coughs> private sector and private business has a very, very important role to play. And if you go by the assertions of, of uh, Bhagwati looking at the growth story all across the globe and in India. Uh, this is the paradigm which suits us very well, and I'm one of the votary of this paradigm, which says that okay, growth imperative has to be strong. Now, when growth is story uh, imperative has to be strong, then what we need basically is to create a scenario where the economy grows in a better way, and therefore reviving growth is very important for us. The moment growth revives, everything revives. Now, the only problem that happens with it is what Paul Streeton has pointed out sometimes that when growth becomes very strong. What happens is that it gets concentrated in few pockets, and then you'll, you will quite often see the small island of prosperity growing in your country. That's the only problem that you have with a strong growth, because inequality actually gets inbuilt when the growth starts becoming very, very strong. And this is seen, this is this has been seen all over the world. We need to focus on this uh, aspect, and the government may have a lot of big role to play to, to take care of the fact that the inequality is taken care of. But Growth per se cannot be denied. So that's my first presumption, and which, which says that well, revival of growth is very important, and that's why I think uh, when Raghuram Rajan is is uh, given the charge of RBI, uh, it's, it's a good move, and because it shows that well, the monetary stability is very important, as he in his first in interview has made it very clear that he is working on the monetary stability. Monetary stability is very important. Once monetary stability comes, the growth, the chances for growth to revive back will be very high. So there are interconnections that I can talk about, but I'm not going to that in that detail. I'm going to the second part now. So the first part is, is basically talking about that growth is important and reviving growth is important. And it's not that the human capital formation in the country or the quality of life in the country is going to suffer if you, if you focus more on growth or give private sector a, a chance to come up in a big way and contribute to growth. Uh, it's not that it's going to take a toll in terms of social indicators in our country. So that's the only point I wanted to make by telling you these two stories, uh, these two, two, two important uh, economists uh, which India has produced. Now what happens is that, now the second part is that when you look at uh, the, the growth, then you have, you, you need to understand one more uh, you know, important aspect that is associated with growth. And this has come up uh, precisely from the growth story all around the world, which says that the moment you look at the the quality of life or environmental quality, because you know, growth depends on how much you interface with the environment and how much you take from the environment, how much resources you're using, because your entire growth depends on that, how much resources you're using for production and, and the other growth purposes. The moment we talk about quality, uh, product, the quality environment, health <coughs> conscious product, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a direct, it's a direct function of how much money you have. Uh, 
just to make my point very clear, I'd just like to share one very strange story with all of you. Uh, you know, one of our relatives uh, used to study in, uh, live in the U.S. and when they come to India and uh, uh, my wife is here and you know, she used to share this story with me and I was really curious to understand why this phenomenon, you know, I was not able to crack this phenomenon. So when they will come to India, they will buy mineral water bottle and give their babies bath with mineral water. You know, uh, as, as a child, you know, uh, as my wife was not able to understand this phenomenon uh, and she, she thought perhaps this is, this is one way to show that they are big people. And I also, of late, you know, of the opinion that well, this is just a demonstration uh, of prosperity and make people understand that they are big, and that's the reason why this this kind of behavior. But you know, it's only of late we understood through research that well, this is not a demonstration of uh, of the fact that you know we are big people. That's why we are doing it. It's precisely the defensive behavior, right? Now, every individual has defense, developed defensive behavior when your income increases. If you don't have income, if you're poor, you don't develop those defensive behavior. Now, what is this defensive behavior of human being? We have to understand that's a market-driven phenomenon. So what happens is that defensive behavior here in this example is that if they don't do this, that they're going to save some money on mineral water, which they otherwise would have spent, right? So a couple of thousands of money they will save. But if their children get sick because there is a change in climate and there is uncertainty about hygiene, they are not very really sure about that. And if the children fall sick, then the total amount they will spend on recovery will be much more than what they are spending on the mineral water, right? Defensive behavior. So their their their, their response, uh, you know, this kind of response by the consumer uh, is not a part of demonstration. It's a part of defensive behavior. Right? So I'm going to focus on this particular aspect because this has got lots of business implications. And therefore, when I'm talking about uh, some, of the, some of the business priorities, I'm going to focus on this particular aspect more. Number one I would like to talk about is advocacy, which is quite relevant for all of us sitting over here. Uh, what I mean by advocacy is that you know, we need to note down that governments has failed to provide leadership but business needing long-term policy certainty because one of the things that uh, plaguing each one of us and is, is the kind of uncertain environment that we are in. If there is X policy in place, how long this X policy is going to continue is doubtful. And therefore at the bottom of it, we are not very certain, certain that, okay, if the government has come up with some policy, uh, whether I'm going to remain with this policy for all time to come or not. And therefore, for a small business, the role, for, role of advocacy is very important. So you actually, by doing this advocacy, uh, you actually can probably you know, create an environment by yourself where there's some kind of certainty about policies in the long term can be ensured. Uh, proactively lobbying, for example, and that's the reason why I say that the agencies like CII or bodies like you know, Rajasthan Chamber of Commerce, and they hold immense value. They hold immense value. So one of the first, the first and foremost thing I would like to talk about in this change in the economic environment is advocacy. So you know you need to take advantage of these platforms where all of you have the opportunity to get together, talk about something common, uh, may not directly affecting your business, but maybe indirectly affecting your business, or maybe not affecting your business at all today. But still, you have to be a part of it because you are living in an age where your government has not provided or is not, has not been able to provide you the kind of consistency which is required for business to grow. And that's why advocacy. Now, from advocacy comes the partnership. We might think sometimes that uh, making partnership uh, with, uh, you know, in a charitable partnership with NGOs or with communities or even with the competitors is not a good thing to happen because this has got its own cost. It makes a lot of sense to incur this cost. That's my you know, idea today. Uh, because what we call partnership today in, in most of the cases uh, is, is, is basically an engagement. Uh, engagement is not partnership. Partnership is not a snapshot thing. We're talking about a long-term trajectory in partnership. So even if you have to make partnership with your rival, never hesitate. Because 
that's what is going to sustain, make you sustain order. And, and in, in his beginning remark, Mr. Rai has already pointed out that networking is, has got its own worth. And if you look at total economy, GDP in US today, they're saying that, okay, innovative ideas and networking, consultancy, has actually created huge amount of GDP in the US economy. And it's contributing more than 60-70% of the GDP is contributed by these things. So definitely networking has got its own worth. And, and it's a long-term partnership that, that I would like to advocate. Now I'm going to come back to uh, my main point, uh, which I would like to emphasize a little more. And one is, uh, there are two parts of, of it I'm going to talk about. One is uh, the voluntary restraint that is defensive behavior, which I have already spoken about. And this is uh, you know, technically called externalities, because the moment we do something, it has got externalities. It may be positive externalities or negative externalities. As everything has got opportunity cost, uh, everything has got externalities as well. And economics, by the way, doesn't have much uh, bigger ideas, but it has got only few small ideas, and these ideas are so powerful that makes economic science so, so versatile. And one of the ideas is externalities, another is opportunity cost. And we need to look at this idea very well. For example, if you are here, you are not somewhere, somewhere else. So the cost of you being here is that you are not somewhere else, that you could have done something else over there. Say, for example, your mother would have uh, you know, prepared, to give you some, a very simple example, would have prepared a you know, very nice key, and you would have been enjoying that, if you would not have been here. So the cost of you being here is the key that you are losing. And there can be several ways of looking at it. What is the opportunity cost that each one of you have? So even if you're sleeping, you have the opportunity cost. Every action that you do has a opportunity cost. Therefore, every action you do as a business in TT has got externality. It can be positive or it can be negative. Uh, negative externalities are very important to be taken care of. And does it make sense for the business people to take care of negative externalities? Do we, do we, in first place, do we know what negative externalities we are emanating from it? I'll just give you one example. There was a wonderful policy that government came up with the mid 60s, in the mid 60s, around time, 1965-66, and that was uh, popularly known as a Green Revolution. All of us are aware about that. And that confined or given a large benefit to Punjab and Haryana state. Though the alluvial <laughs> soil was found much more fertile in the state of you know, Bihar and Rajasthan and part of, part of Orissa, but the benefit of green revolution had gone more to Punjab and Haryana, and they benefited so much. Now look at what Center for Science and Environment of late has found. They took the sample, uh, blood sample of the farmers of Punjab and Haryana, and they tested these samples in the laboratory. And what they found was astonishing. They found that the average residue of harmful chemical substances in the Punjab farm of blood is 600 times more than what is being prescribed by WHO. Now look at the damage that it has done to the society. And therefore, you say, we have achieved in paddy, we have achieved in wheat, that's your good. But at the same time, you have created huge externality which is costing the society, and that's the bad you have produced. And therefore, every action that we do today has got goods to be produced, which we focus more, but how about the bad we are producing along with that? Is there any bad we are producing along with that? You know, this is something that we have to look at. Now that's one contention. And why this is important is that the consumer point of view, these bads are <coughs> extremely getting important. I give you one example that uh, our relatives uh, using defensive behavior. So they are actually signing away or trying to find out the ways to avoid these bads. Right? They were just trying to avoid the consumer consciously or unconsciously is going to develop or has already developed this. Why? Because the per capita income is increasing. The moment you have better income, the more conscious you become on these counts. Right? And does it make a good business sense to look at this aspect? Yes, of course it makes a lot of business sense because your future survival is going to depend on that. Because if per capita income has gone up beyond 25,000 in India,